my name is Dr. Professor James T. Huckleberry, and I am at the University of Southern Bamboozla, Missouri. I just wanted to present to you um, a recent talk that I gave at a conference uh, regarding uh, the misunderstood nature of radiation as part of our series, Subatomic Particles and You. And here to join us is one of our students from the university. Hello. And please introduce yourself. I'm Emma from the university. That's the University of Southern Bamboozla. Go Swamp Rats. So, uh, so we start our, our presentation with a, a quote from the, uh, my esteemed colleague, J. Frank Parnell. Radiation. Yes, indeed, you have the... You hear the most outrageous lies about it, pernicious nonsense, and I couldn't agree more. It's crazy. People fear the unknown, so we're going to address that today by learning a little bit about radiation. Have okay. you ever wondered about radiation, Emma? I have heard some things. Well, it's natural to be concerned, especially with events that may have happened that people misinterpret as dangerous to their health. For example, the Three Mile Island nuclear power plant uh, meltdown, which occurred back in 1979, had many people worried and alarmed. So folks at the Lawrence Livermore Laboratory developed a unit of measurement called the BED. BED stands for Banana Equivalent Dose. Really? It's wow. the same. You see, we're actually surrounded and bathed in radiation all the time. Hmm. One of the most radioactive foods that you find is the common banana. That's right. And we'll get more into that later. But one BED is equivalent to the amount of radiation exposure equivalent to eating one banana. Wow. Now, part of how they developed this unit of measurement was um, using a model scenario. Now imagine that you live, say, 10 miles from the Three Mile Island nuclear power plant. And you wake up one morning to find out it's melted down. What is your radiation, radioactive exposure? How dangerous is it? Well, if you had lived 10 miles away from Three Mile Island during the time that it was melting down in 1979, your radiation exposure uh, would have added up to 800 BED, or the equivalent of eating 800 bananas. That's a lot of bananas. It's a lot of bananas. And while, but is it really dangerous to eat? I mean, you've eaten probably in your lifetime 800 bananas, right? True. So. But not you, all at once. Do you feel like you've been irradiated? I don't know. Sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> I get those feelings too sometimes. <laughs> well, people did um, take issue with the unit of measurement, the BED, and part of the reason for that is biology. Yes. You see, the body maintains a state of homeostasis. Do you know what homeostasis means? It sounds familiar. Well, it has to do with the body's uh, tendency to keep things in balance. So one of the methods that the body uses to keep things in balance is to excrete things that are in excess. Now, a human body, of course, can take in food and therefore radiation, um, but then it gets rid of some of that. So the, you're never, if you were to eat 800 bananas, let's say, um, you would not keep that radioactive banana material inside your body. It would, that could get messy. It would pass on. <laughs> but a banana does not excrete. So when it receives radiation, as is present in all throughout nature, uh, it has nowhere to go. Yeah. That's one of the differences between us and bananas. <laughs> Just one of the many differences. <laughs> so the BED unit of measurement was changed to account for this fact, um, where now a, a BED count of 800 would be equivalent to the amount of radiation exposure equivalent to sleeping each night on a bed with 800 bananas. Is this for real? Yes, of course. 
<laughs> who sleeps with bananas? That doesn't make any sense. Only people who are concerned okay. with scientific rigor, <laughs> such things. Okay. Oh my goodness. So why are bananas radioactive, you asked? And to get into that, let's discuss potassium. You've probably heard that bananas are high in potassium, and that's yes. true. The banana plant does scavenge potassium from the soil. And it turns out that potassium is a fascinating uh, element, uh, you can, present over here on the far left of the, uh, the periodic table. It has a, a number there of 19, representing the number of um, electrons in its electron sphere. Uh, so it has 19 protons, 19 electrons, and it can have different numbers of neutrons present in the nucleus. Um, and these different numbers of neutrons essentially account for the different isotopes. Do you know what an isotope is, Emma? I actually do, but I kind of forgot. But I heard about it once. Right. So different isotopes have different chemical properties and different radiological properties. Uh, for potassium, the most common isotope is K39, potassium 39. Uh, about 93% of the potassium found on planet Earth is of this um, nuclear state. It's a stable form, stable isotope of potassium. Uh, over here, with a 41 nuclear count, uh, that's about roughly a bit less than 7%, and it's also stable. But in the middle here, potassium-40. Now that's an interesting isotope. Potassium-40 is stable mostly. But I have to say mostly because it does decay, and it decays in a very interesting way. Um, it has a half-life of about 1.25 billion years. So if you were to start with, let's say, 800 bananas worth of potassium, after 1.25 billion years, you would have only 400 bananas worth of potassium. Wow. So let's have a closer look at this interesting isotope, potassium-40. Something fascinating about potassium-40 as a source of radioactive energy is it's one of the things that's heating up our Earth. You've probably heard a lot about global warming. Did you know that it's not just us? Oh no, is it the bananas? In fact, it's our own planet Earth, which is heating up from the inside due to radiogenic thermogenesis. Wow. The main three culprits for this are thorium-232, uranium, you've probably heard of that one, 238, and then also present in the core of our planet is quite a bit of potassium-40. And these, these, when these uh, isotopes break down, they release particles that then heat up because they're energetic and they collide with things. Um, they heat up our planet from the inside. Hmm. In fact, the breakdown of potassium-40, there's so much of it that uh, when it breaks down, and we're going to get into some detail here, it can do so in different ways. Uh, but one of the ways it breaks down is to turn into argon-40. Argon is a gas. It's a noble gas. It. It's present in our atmosphere at about 1%. Now, argon-40 would not be present at all on planet Earth, except for its degradation from potassium. So that 1% mm. of argon in our atmosphere, entirely mm. from the breakdown of potassium. Wow. Well, let's start over here on the left with potassium-40. Now, potassium-40, most of the time, about 90% of the time, when it degrades, again, not very often, but when it does, um, typically it will, 90% of the time, uh, convert into calcium-40. And it does that by releasing an electron and a neutrino, but we're not going to talk about those today. Um, but it, that's not the only way. It ha it's a bit of an exotic isotope in that it has different methods to break down. Not only can it turn into calcium, but also it can degrade into argon, as we discussed earlier. And when it does that, its degradation path almost all the time does one thing. It accepts an electron and then releases a gamma ray, which is an energetic particle that can heat up uh, the Earth from inside, for example. So 10% of the time, roughly, uh, that's the method that potassium-40 turns into argon-40. But every once in a while, very rarely, there's another way that potassium can turn into argon. And that involves emitting a pro positron. 
Do you know what a positron is, Emma? I don't. It's, that sounds very posy. It's, it's <laughs> antimatter. Oh, shit. Yes, what? antimatter, which is a fascinating, opposite, bizarro world version mean? of matter. Well, you know how an electron has a negative charge? Yeah. Well, a positron is like the opposite of that. Wow. It's the same thing, but a positive charge. Wow. And when an electron and a positron uh -huh. collide, they annihilate each other in an energetic blast. You can see that right here. So once this positron gets emitted, very likely it's going to encounter an electron. You have an annihilation event, and gamma wow. rays are released en masse. Oh, my God. Are they drawn to each other? Yes, because they have Magnetic. those opposite charges. Yeah. And those attract, which opposite is one reason why it doesn't last very long in our modern world. We don't have a lot of <laughs> antimatter lying around. It's mostly just matter. Wow. But there is antimatter. And in fact, these bananas that we see here in front of us, they're emitting positrons roughly once every hour. Really? That's how much potassium-40 they have in them. So if you were to eat a banana... Hello? <laughs> You're going to be emitting pot antimatter all the time. That is crazy. So this is one of the reasons why I don't think people should be concerned and overly worried about radiation in our world. It's all around us. We're soaking in it. Okay. So you're telling me it's okay to use the microwave? I think the microwave is safe. In fact, everyone should get about 100 chest x-rays a year, according to my uh, esteemed colleague, Dr. Parnell. Really? True. That's a lot. It's like every day. So uh, that ends our uh, discussion of potassium and subatomic particles and you. I've been Dr. Professor James D. Huckleberry. Go Swamp Rats! Thanks, Professor. You're welcome, Emma. I learned so much. I'll see you in class. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs>